he's the Mother Teresa of Pakistan. To many, he's almost a saint. Every day, Satar Edi collects the dead and abandoned from the streets of Karachi. Around him, one of the world's biggest cities is descending into chaos. A one-man social security system, Satar Edi and his volunteers run clinics and emergency centers, take in unwanted babies and bury the unwanted dead. Edie's massive graveyard outside Karachi looks like a war cemetery. Most buried here don't have names, only numbers. This year alone, more than 1,400 people have been killed in Karachi. It's become one of the most dangerous places on earth. In the middle of the city, Edi headquarters are an island in the storm. And the other thing is that our country's politics and thoughts are in the land, 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 इंडस्ट्रियलिस्ट पे जो बड़े बड़े टैक्स चोट असला परोसों पे हिरोन परोसों पे बाराल कैटेगरीज वाल लोगों की ग्रुपिंग हमारे यहाँ पड़ी कंट्रोल और कब्जा लेकर बैठे हैं। Today, as it does about once a week, the city is grinding to a standstill. The MQM. The party with de facto control of Karachi is showing its strength by calling a strike day. Each crossroad is a sniper's alley. In this part of town, any driver is a strike breaker. Any car or bus is a target. There's no official war here, but much of Karachi looks like a battlefield. Two years ago, the MQM, an ethnically Indian party, won Karachi's elections. Pakistan's government threw them out and brought in the army. After months of battles and bloodshed, the army withdrew. Now Karachi has 30,000 police and paramilitaries. The one constant has been Karachi's growing death toll. Behind some houses, this empty land is a regular dumping ground for bodies. The feet and hands are bound. There are signs of torture. Most likely, it's an MQM assassination, the fate of an informer. It barely matters. In a city fueled by drug dealing, gun running and bribery, Murder is expected. ये हर मोले के अंदर एक फैक्ट्री है। बदमाश लोग वहाँ बैठे रहते हैं। ये आम के इलाकों के अंदर ये लोग अपना कंट्रोल रख के दबाए होते हैं। रात को शराब भी बेचते हैं, जुआ भी खेलते हैं, मोले वालों से ब्लैकमेलिंग भी करते हैं, बत्ते भी लेते हैं और इनके पीछे ये इनसे जब भी कोई चाहे तो अपना इलेक्शन के दौरान में या कोई प्रोटेस्टन के तरमियान में इनका फायदा उठाते हैं। A few blocks from the dumping ground, the local police station is stranded on a front line. Behind it, paramilitaries man the rooftops. In front of it, 
MQN snipers hide in the streets. For the police, a dead body is routine paperwork. Investigating it is almost out of the question. Identifying the victim is hard enough. Finding the criminal is almost impossible. It's a black joke in Karachi that when the police hear gunfire, they run in the opposite direction. But it's hardly surprising. They're paid a pittance, and almost every day one of them is murdered. It's a sign of the decay that Karachi's only computerized investigation system has been developed by a millionaire businessman. Choose a couple of points, hairstyles, nose, ears, eyes, and then develop the sketch as close as possible till we can develop a proper sketch of a person. And do the police have anything like this? No, the police does not have it. I mean, there's the only computer available, not only in Karachi, but in Pakistan, where we do it. Jamil Yusuf's unlikely career change began when a spree of kidnappings blitzed Karachi's businessmen. Helped out by the army, Yusuf tapped phones and did what the police hadn't. In his words, he wiped out the kidnappers. Since then, Jamil Yusuf has been taking on a new and more difficult target. Karachi, you can say, it's been a total collapse of the rule of law, which has been decaying due to quite a few years. Corrupt police, argues Yusuf, are the willing tools of corrupt politicians. In Karachi, he says, there's a fine line between police fighting criminals and the government targeting its opposition. There have been extortion going on. People are suffering. They will be willing to cooperate with the government provided they feel the confidence with the government. Provided innocent people are not put behind bars and implicated in wrong cases. How much people really support the NQM is arguable. When it was in power, it did little to help them. Now that it's out, its battle with the government is killing Pakistan's richest commercial centre. Karachi is still the country's biggest port, but foreign investors are fleeing. Local businesses are crippled by strikes and shutdowns. These days, living in Karachi and avoiding the city's battle is getting more and more difficult. But some are still trying. A night out for Karachi's well-to-do often means an expensive party at a five-star hotel. Though he probably doesn't realize it, tonight Samir is the guest of honor. He's celebrating his first birthday. The chances are Samir will grow up in a divided city. He'll drive to work on flyovers that bypass the poor suburbs, live behind shuttered windows and keep security guards outside his door. This is the other side of Karachi, the old hometown of Pakistan's Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto. These days, she spends little time in the city, but the influential families are still here making money. On the other side of their security fences, Pakistan's biggest city is running out of control. They, like their Prime Minister, are doing little to stop it. As a Karachiite, I've been very concerned about the rise of the politics of violence and the rise of the politics of violence has been associated with the rise of an ethnic party known as the MQM. Do you accept though that the MQM does have public support in Karachi? I do not think that MQM has a monopoly on Karachi, no. I think MQM has pockets of support where it has been assisting in the illegal immigration trade and where people live in slums and kachi bodies and there's a sense of deprivation, so they have been trying to exploit that sense of deprivation. Uh, it started off in 1985, and it exhorted people to sell videos and television and to buy arms, 
and since then there's been a killing spree. But Karachi's terror is only one danger. Years of neglect have added others almost as lethal. A mother of ten, Sadara Begum, did nothing more than ride in a bus on an MQM strike day. Now Satar Edi's son, Faisal, has rushed her to hospital in a voluntary ambulance. Sadara has been brought to civil hospital, one of only four government emergency hospitals in a city of eight million people. This is casualty. The chances of saving a life here are minimal. The blood drip, if it works, has to be carried. There's little light, little equipment, and little that's clean. Even Baghdad's hospitals, after years of sanctions, are in better condition. Turning Karachi around now could be demanding the impossible. Even the small traditional industries are dying. In Karachi's poor northern suburbs, weavers are known for their fine silk and delicate patterns. A full day's weaving only earns four dollars, but now even that's getting difficult. Between them, Saira and Alia have ten children. They weave at home, often surrounded by fighting. But selling their silk has become almost impossible. It's difficult to travel, and the nearby shop is too afraid to open. In some areas, and for some years, Karachiites have been picking up the pieces. Abandoned by governments, the people of Orangi built a self-help project that's been copied all over the world. It was, they say, all working reasonably well till a few months ago, when the government brought in the paramilitary. Since then, there's been more violence and shooting. It's a sign of the crisis that Pakistan's government has begun talking to the NQM opposition. What do the people feel about the talks? Do they take them seriously? No, not at all. But so far, the talks have gone nowhere. Actually, how much can government do? That's a question I'd like to ask. Because uh, we have fed people this uh, false notion that government can take every care of everything from the cradle to the grave. Of course, government can't do everything. And I appreciate that point. But can you understand how people could feel angry with the government and alienated from it when they have to live in the miserable sort of conditions that there are in many parts of Karachi. Yes, people were angry, but who was responsible? It was the MQM. They were in government in 87. They were in government in 88. They were in government in 1990. What did they do for the people of Karachi? They ate up the money of Karachi. They used it to pay their cadre. They used it on entertainment. They used it on guns. They used it to transfer money to foreign countries. And can the press write about it? No. Karachi press can't write. Because if the Karachi press writes about it, they'll be killed. I am sorry. Can we now go on to other questions? May I just ask one more question? No, because I have answered enough questions on this. It's now it's nearly all over the city. It's not that I can close my eyes to another part because it has reached my house also. The fire is, has spread and I may be a victim tomorrow. I might be living in any other district of Karachi, but I could be a victim very fast. <laughs> Karachi does still have its optimists and idealists. Ask Satar Edi where he finds hope and he'll bring you here to one of his orphanages. Karachi's orphans Call Satar Edi and his wife, Mummy and Daddy. They too are Karachi's victims, the children of the poor and the murdered. Uh, 
मैं सारा लावर को रखा निकाल छुट्टी दी कुछ किया उसमें जितना सुकून नहीं है जितना इन बच्चों में मुझे To these children, Seta Edi means hope. Their city may need a lot, but what they're asking for is heartbreakingly little.